Good day, I'm Norman Wahlberger. In this video we're going to have an introduction to a very big subject. The subject of what is a curve and more particularly what is an algebraic curve. So we're going to start to investigate notions which we're going to have to say a lot more about in coming videos. I'm going to show you some pictures. We're going to have a little bit of a historical discussion. I want you to start thinking about curves and the question, how should we approach what a curve is? It's historically a very interesting and problematic notion. So the motivation is that in the last half a dozen videos or so, we've introduced what we might call algebraic calculus. This is an approach to calculus which is really oriented at a high school student. It's very elementary. It doesn't involve any notions of limits, of real numbers, or of functions. For us so far, this algebraic calculus has been developed in the context of polynomials. And it allows us to define and utilize Taylor expansions, subderivatives, and to talk about tangents. Tangents meaning not just tangent lines, but also tangent conics and higher tangents. A natural question that many of you probably have is, okay, that's, that's good, that's interesting. How are we going to extend this algebraic calculus to more general functions? For example, those of you who have studied some mathematics before you, you've seen functions perhaps like this, x squared minus 1 over x to the fourth plus 3. You can think of that as a function of x according to the standard dogma. Or you can think of the square root of x cubed plus 1. Or maybe sine of x to the fifth. Or perhaps the exponential function combined with a circular function, e to the tan x. So does this algebraic approach to calculus work for these kinds of things? If so, how? Some of you might also be wondering how we're going to extend this elementary calculus to go beyond functions to considering more general curves, for example, conics or cubics. For example, if you are interested in an ellipse, for example, an ellipse like this, perhaps you know that in the standard formulation of things, an ellipse like this has an equation involving both x and y. Not just y equals a function of x, but a relation involving both x's and y's together. So that's not really a function because for any value of x, there is more than one associated value of y. But nevertheless, it's a reasonable geometrical object. We might very well want to know, for example, how to compute a tangent and how to compute the slope of that tangent at some point. Here's another example, x squared over 16 minus y squared over 25 equals 1. That's a hyperbola. It's also not a function in the usual sense, but it's certainly a pleasant geometrical object. I've also shown you a curve which is a little bit more complicated. This one here in red, that has equation x cubed plus y cubed plus 3xy equals 0. It's called the folium of Descartes. That's an example of a cubic curve. And again there, we might ask not just for how you calculate a tangent, but how do you calculate a tangent conic at a point. And here's another one, this one right here, that's given by an equation like this, which is of actually of degree 4. So this is another question, can we calculate Taylor expansions of these things? Does it make sense to talk about subderivatives? Can we compute tangents, for example, tangent lines? tangent conics, or maybe tangent cubics even, for higher degree such curves. All right, so what we're really asking here is, is there such a notion of an algebraic calculus on an algebraic curve? The idea being that these things should be algebraic curves because ultimately they're given by polynomials involving x and y. So they're reasonably pleasant algebraic objects. There should be a pleasant calculus for them too. Of course that brings up the question, well what exactly are we talking about here when we talk about an algebraic curve? What does that mean? So let's have a historical look at these questions by going back to the ancient Greeks to start with and having a look at what they were thinking about in the context of curves. Greek mathematics 
emphasizes the importance of the straight edge and compass for making geometrical constructions and corresponding to the notions of line and circle as being the fundamental curves or mathematical objects out of which most other things are built. So those are the primary curves in Greek mathematics. Then sort of one level up, they discovered the conic sections. And the conic sections are obtained by essentially, first of all, combining the circle and the line to get a cone. So the cone is what you get when you take a circle and then a point not in the plane of that circle and drawing all the lines from that point to all the various points on the circle. Get a cone. And then the conic sections are obtained by slicing that cone with a plane. If you slice the cone with a plane in that orientation, you get an elliptical cross-section. If you slice it with a plane, something like this, then you cut both the top and the bottom parts of the cone to get a hyperbolic cross-section, or hyperbola. And then sort of halfway between these, poised between them, is the case when the plane is just parallel to one of the lines of the cone. So it cuts the cone only in one of its parts, and that way you get a parabola. So these are the three standard kinds of conic sections, but they're in fact sort of degenerate ones as well. We could also consider the case when the plane slices right through this point here in such a way that it also, say, slices through those two lines there, forming an X. So a pair of intersecting lines is uh, also a, a conic section. In fact, if we took a plane that went like this, then we would be just picking up one line. So one line, you might think of it as a doubled line, is also a conic section. And the most degenerate case is when you take a plane that just slices the cone in its vertex there, then you're only picking up a single point. So this notion of conic sections does have um, degenerate cases too. Okay, and these were well studied. Uh, by Archimedes and Apollonius uh, prominently, and the ancient Greeks learnt a lot about them. But they also considered quite a few other curves, some of them very interesting. For example, Archimedes introduced the idea of a spiral, and he thought very mechanically, physically. He imagined a line, which was fixed at a point, rotating uniformly about that point, actually sort of a ray, I guess. And then imagine on that line, imagine a particle moving linearly along that line at the same time that the ray is rotating. Okay, so if the particle starts there, then after a little while it's uh, here, and then it's uh, there. I'll sort of try to follow it, roughly. Something like this. So you get this spiral uh, shape, which goes on uh, indefinitely, and he proved some very nice things about it. These days, it's most easily described in polar coordinates using the rho and theta and has a relatively simple equation in terms of those. There's the cissoid of Diocles, which is obtained from a circle. And here are two perpendicular diameters of the circle. And from this point here, we go an equal arc in this direction and in this direction. So once we've gone equal amounts in this direction and this direction, we take the line perpendicular to uh, this diameter through that point, and then we connect this point with that point there to obtain the intersection right there. And as we change these two points, making them wider or further apart, then this intersection traces out a curve. If we consider the corresponding pair up here, we also get this part of the curve. And the curve is naturally extended, it really wants to keep going, even though the construction uh, doesn't do that for us, but it wants to keep going. And it turns out that algebraically, it has an equation like this. If you put the origin at the center of the circle, y squared a plus x equals a minus x all cubed, where a is the radius of the circle. Um, 
Then there was the Conchoid of Nicomedes, which was also around 200 BC. And it's also uh, something that's reasonably natural. It's also formed by lines. So we have a, a fixed line there. We have a fixed point here. And then we're considering the various lines going through our fixed point. And we're looking at uh, going a fixed length from the baseline on any one of these lines. So any one of these lines, we then go a fixed length in the direction from the line. Okay? And then these points trace out some curve, which will sort of asymptotically approach the line as we go out in that direction. And that's the conchoid of Nicomedes. And I think he actually made actually a mechanical construction that would actually draw this thing for you. So the, the ancient Greeks did think in terms of mechanical constructions for their curves. Another kind of curve that was considered are the spheric sections where you get a torus, and a torus or a donut, what you get when you take a circle and you rotate it around an axis. So this has a cr circular cross section and this is also a circular direction here. So we're rotating a circle around a circle to get a donut. And then these spheric sections, these are the curves that you get by slicing this donut by a plane. And the various curves that you get depend very much on where the plane is in relation to the, to the donut. You can get sort of, you get a pair of circles, or you get kind of an oval shape, or a curve that kind of indents a little bit. Or a very interesting sort of special case is when the curve is such that it cr crosses there and you get a sort of figure eight curve. Of course, ancient peoples were very interested in astronomy, in particular figuring out what's going on with the planets in the night sky. And to understand that, Ptolemy introduced the notion of an epicycle, which is a curve that's formed when one circle rotates about another circle, and we're watching the image of a point. So if this point rotates, if the circle rotates, then the trajectory of such a point is something like this, looping around the, uh, the bigger circle. All right, so the ancient Greeks had a variety of curves that they were interested in, and they had both a mechanical and geometrical understandings of these curves. The next really important development is in the time of the Europeans, around the 17th century, with René Descartes and this fundamental treatise, La Geometrie, in which he introduces the idea of algebraic coordinates to deal with geometrical problems. And it's from this that we get our notion of Cartesian coordinates with an x-axis, a y-axis, equally spaced labels along each axis, and the idea that you can represent a curve by an equation. And conversely, given an equation, you can picture it by a curve. So absolutely fundamental innovation and advance in mathematics, probably in, in pure mathematics, the, uh, perhaps one of the most important innovations in the last 500 years. And Descartes realized that the power of this point of view was that the algebra tells you a lot about the curve. And you can calculate purely algebraically instead of having to make geometrical constructions. And he realized that, that if you took the simplest possible relation between x and y, namely a linear relation of the form ax plus by plus c equals zero, then you're getting a line. And conversely, a line always has some linear relation like this. And he would have been very excited when he discovered that if you go up one level to degree two curves, so you're considering all equations of the form ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared plus dx plus ey plus f equals zero. And here these numbers a, b, c, d, e, and f are all numbers. So if you consider that kind of equation, then the corresponding point xy traces out a conic. And every conic can be expressed in this form. So this is an incredibly exciting development. He can then see how to prove pretty well everything that Apollonius knew about conics by working with the algebraic representation of them. And he also sees that there's a natural hierarchy of curves depending on the degree. That's the linear 
degree one. That's quadratic, degree two. So there's a natural progression of complexity of curves depending on the degree. One can't underestimate the importance of this development. So I think anybody who is mathematically minded, when they hear about this story, naturally they're going to ask, well, all right, if, if degree two curves are the conic sections of the ancient Greeks, what are the degree three curves? Absolutely natural, obvious question. What do they look like? Well, uh, people were interested, of course, and Isaac Newton, famous for many, many things, of course, including the, the development of the calculus and the laws of motion, including the resolution of the, the, the conundrum of how the planets move. He investigated cubic curves with the idea of taking a general cubic curve, which rather has this long, intimidating structure. So it's a combination of x cubed, x squared y, xy squared, y cubed, and then lower degree terms like x squared, xy, y squared, x and y, and just a constant. So he took one of those equations and said, well, if I graph that, what am I going to get? What does it look like? And he made various transformations to try to get them into sort of standard forms. Just as there's more or less three conics, at least three non-degenerate conics, he tried to analyze how many uh, cubics there were. And I think his list has some 70 or 80 in it. It wasn't completely correct. But anyway, the cubic story is much more involved than the conic story, but still very interesting. So here's just some brief indication of what cubics can look like. So in black here, that's a possible shape of a cubic. See, it actually has two components. Or it um, could look like, like this thing here. Or it could look like this with sort of a cusp. Or it could look like a bunch of branches, maybe even with a, an isolated point. Or it could have even three branches like this. Uh, there's quite a lot of possibilities for what a cubic looks like. And of course, then there's the corresponding questions, well, what about the higher degree curves? Once we've understood cubics, more or less, what about quartics, fourth degree curves, or quintics, fifth degree curves, and so on. And I have to say that, of course, nowadays this is subsumed in, in algebraic geometry. But it's a bit of a mystery to me why algebraic geometers don't spend more time and, and energy explaining to the rest of us what the answers to this natural question are. I think it would be lovely to have more pictures of algebraic curves so we can see some of the variety and the beauty of these objects. Actually, there's a reason why, why they don't do that um, partially, but we'll get to that later when we talk more about algebraic geometry. But it, you can see here that, okay, these kind of curves that result from thinking about the degree of a polynomial in X and Y in a Cartesian setting introduced by Descartes, very reasonable, very natural, uh, perhaps very pleasant field of investigation. But there's a lot more to curves than these things. So the 17th and 18th century saw a lot of work and development of not just the algebraic curves that we've been talking about, but also other kinds of curves that had often a mechanical formulation. For example, a catenary, which is the shape formed by a hanging chain. So if you get a chain and you hang it from two equally spaced points, you get some kind of curve, and it's natural to ask, what is the shape of that curve? People thought maybe originally it was a parabola, and it's maybe reasonably close to a parabola, but it's actually a different curve called a catenary. Another important curve that's related to motion is what happens when you roll a circle on a line. It's just like Ptolemy's epicircles, except that the rolling circle is rolling on a line instead of a bigger circle. So if we choose some point on the circle and we follow its path as our given circle rolls, it's going to form something that looks like this. And that's called a cycloid. And that cycloid had a lot of remarkable properties. It was not an algebraic curve, but people eventually realized that it uh, had a lot to do with the, uh, the laws of motion. So if you invert a cycloid, in other words, just turn it upside down, instead of having a branch like this, we have a branch like this, then if we think of the motion of a particle, like a ball, 
rolling down that curve, this has two very interesting properties. First of all, it's what's called the totochrone, meaning equal time curve. And what that means is that if you start the ball anywhere along this curve, anywhere from here up to here, and you drop it and let it roll down, assuming there's no friction, then the amount of time that it takes to get there is fixed. So it takes the same amount of time to roll down from the top as it does from here or even from here. That's a remarkable property of the inverted cycloid. And then another uh, property is the brachistochrone property. That's actually the shortest time curve. If you want to slide down a slide from this point to this point, and you consider all possible curves between these two points, including, for example, a straight line, which is an a very primitive kind of slide, then it turns out that exactly this inverted cycloid is the curve that lets the ball go down fastest. Anything else that you choose will be slightly or much slower. And the names associated with these results are Huygens and Jacob Bernoulli. Jacob, one of the many Bernoulli brothers that played an important role in uh, mathematics. All right, so the, uh, the Europeans had a uh, were very fascinated by, by curves, and they had both an algebraic and a mechanical orientation to them. But even going back to the founder, to Descartes, Descartes realized that one should make a distinction, okay? that there was something special about the algebraic curves that were given by polynomials. And he sort of had this division into uh, mechanical and geometrical. These days, people say algebraic versus transcendental, perhaps, but it's more or less the same thing. So the idea that the algebraic curves given by polynomials are in some sense more amenable to analysis and investigation than these transcendental curves. But still it begs the question, what exactly is a curve? So it's a rather subtle question of what exactly is a curve. And historically it's caused uh, quite a lot of problems and there's been a lot of debate and a lot of introspection and analysis of figuring out what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about a curve. It's easy enough to put our pen down on paper and squiggle around a little bit and get something and say, well, that's a curve. But what exactly are we doing? How are we mathematically modeling that? What is allowed and what is not allowed? It's rather surprising that the modern definition only uh, really took place in around the last part of the 19th century. In the 1880s, Jordan gave this following modern definition of a curve. He said that a curve is a set of points taken on by a pair of continuous functions, x equals f of t, y equals g of t, where t ranges through some interval on the real line. Okay, I put continuous function here in quotes. He, he would not have put it in quotes, but I do, because the notion of continuous function is in fact highly problematic as we'll see later on. Okay? But to Jordan, he thought he knew what a continuous function was, and so he thought, well, this is what it is. It's just a, a pair of continuous functions specifying the x and y coordinate of a point on the plane. Okay, this is a very unfortunate definition. Okay? It's a completely wrong idea. It's very wrong thinking. And it's far too simplistic, and it's, uh, it's logically just a cheating. As we'll see, okay, but, so, but there was already evidence shortly after Jordan gave his definition that there was something fishy going on here. Just a few years afterwards, in 1890, Piano gave an example where a curve, which is a curve by Jordan's definition, had a remarkable, in fact, almost absurd quality. So he showed that you could cook up two continuous functions f of t and g of t, which purportedly took the interval from 0 to 1 onto the square in such a way that it was 1 to 1 and onto and continuous. That means that there's actually a bijection. So this curve, which is not like this, this is some, some kind of simplistic uh, rendition of it, but this curve, whatever it is, takes every point here to every point here in a one-to-one -one way. 
So that the curve, as the set of points obtained, is actually the unit square. So according to Jordan's definition, the unit square is a curve. Okay, so most people, uh, when looking at this example, would say, all right, well, that just proves that the definition is wrong. If I have a definition of a circle, for example, okay, and we ultimately decide that a lemniscate is a circle according to my definition, then a natural deduction is that my definition is not a very good one, that we should forget about it and try something else. That would have been a natural deduction to make from Piano's example, and then other people gave other examples, including Hilbert. But convenience took precedence over logical clarity. These days, the definition of a curve is more or less this one. Except that people have changed their tune just slightly to say, okay, the curve is not actually the image, it's actually the pair of functions. So the pair of functions is the curve. Okay, but still, Piano's curve is still a curve in the modern definition. Students are usually not shown this in, in an introductory calculus class because it's a little bit embarrassing. Okay? Just as it was embarrassing in the last part of the 19th century. A lot of embarrassing things happened in the last part of the 19th century, by the way. Okay? Things which are still uh, casting their shadow over modern mathematics. We're going to talk a lot more about them. So, if the notion of a curve is perhaps at this point too ambitious, perhaps we should scale down our intentions and try to do something more modest. Why don't we stick with algebraic curves just the way Descartes urged us to do? That's much more amenable, much more treatable with logical clarity. And there's a natural way forward going back to Descartes and Newton and the pioneers of the subject. So an excellent way of starting to think about curves is by using the framework of bipoly numbers. Let me remind you that a bipoly number is a two-dimensional version of a poly number. It's a, a rectangular array of numbers. And most of the time we'll be using examples where the numbers are integers. So here, for example, 1, 2, 0, 3, minus 1, 4, 3. And if you like, you can think of zeros as occupying these other points. I just, I'm too lazy to write them down. And this has an alternate expression in terms of alphas and betas. So roughly oriented the same way here. This is 1 plus 2 beta, 0 beta squared, 3 beta cubed, minus alpha plus 4 alpha beta plus 3 alpha squared. So increasing powers of alpha in this direction and betas in this direction. We would write this more usually just in a linear fashion. 1 plus 2 beta plus 3 beta cubed minus alpha plus 4 alpha beta plus 3 alpha squared. So whether we're talking about this as a polynomial in alpha and beta, or this thing as a poly number, it's pretty well the same thing. Now, to connect it to the discussion we've just been having, we can replace alpha with x and beta with y, for example, to get an equation. So associated to this, we can say, oh, we can just think about this equation. This equation is somehow intimately connected with this bipoly number. So some examples. The folium of Descartes, which is a cubic. It has this equation. It can be associated to the bipoly number, or bipolynomial, right here. So this represents the uh, x cubed, this represents the y cubed, this represents the 3xy. As a bipoly number, it's alpha cubed plus beta cubed plus 3 alpha beta. So in other words, when we're studying this thing, or whether we're studying this thing, maybe they're pretty close, maybe they're somehow connected. Maybe we can think about what this is as being this. So here's two other examples. The lemniscate of Bernoulli which is this sort of figure eight shape thing here, has this traditional equation, x squared plus y squared, all squared equals two times x squared minus y squared. And what that means is that the points that are lying on here are exactly the points that satisfy that equation. 
Well, we can expand that out if we want to and bring everything to one side. Then we get a expression of degree 4 in x and y. And if we prefer to use alphas and betas, we can replace x and y with alphas and betas. And then we can say, aha, what we've got here is just a bipoly number. Looks like this. There's a 1 for the alpha to the fourth, a 1 for the beta to the fourth. Here's the 2 alpha squared beta squared term, the minus 2 alpha squared, and the plus 2 beta squared. Here's another example, the Fermat curve x cubed plus y cubed equals 1. Well, if we bring everything to the other side, sort of like alpha cubed plus beta cubed minus 1, which can be represented by a poly number like this. And its graph looks something like this. Now, there's all kinds of subtleties uh, involved here. Okay, this is just an introductory talk. We haven't actually yet pinned any proper definitions down. Just want to get some examples out there on the table. These are the kinds of objects that we would like to consider. Now, there's all kinds of subtlety, however. For example, it's a famous theorem of Fermat that this particular curve actually only has two rational points on it. The only pairs of numbers x and y, which are rational numbers, are these ones here that lie on the curve. One, zero, that's there, and 0, 1. So what am I actually drawing when I draw this? That's a good question. Modern mathematicians will say, oh, I'm drawing real numbers. I'm drawing all the non-rational solutions of this thing, the irrational solutions of this, all properly in quotes. Well, that's uh, highly debatable, okay? and we're going we're gonna to talk about that. But the same question arises here. Can we actually find points that lie on this equation? It's one thing to write down an equation and say, all right, we're going to look at all those points x, y that satisfy the equation. But how do you actually go about actually finding some solutions? You see, this is very different from the situation when we were graphing polynumbers. There we had a polynumber p, and we just graphed all the points x, p of x. So we are guaranteed to get points because we start with x and then we plug x into p and we get the y-coordinate. This is much different because the x and y are intermixed here and we don't have them in the form y equals something. So you can't immediately generate solutions to this. It's highly non-obvious and it's highly difficult in many examples to actually come up with points which actually lie on these supposed curves. Okay, so you can see some of the complicated issues that are related to this notion. Okay? But this is a course in foundations of mathematics. And so these kind of issues are bread and butter for us. We're going to want to examine this in great detail. We want to get this right. Okay? Most of modern mathematics tries to hurry, scurry its way past these foundational issues. Quick, 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 do it very fast, then we'll talk about something else. Not us. We're interested in going very slowly, very carefully, making sure we understand what exactly is going on. Next time I'm going to introduce um, an important idea that will be necessary for us to really understand what a curve is. I'm going to talk about the difference between 20th century mathematics and 21st century mathematics. 20th century mathematics is behind us. 21st century mathematics is largely in the future. There's going to be a big difference, and I'm going to talk about an aspect of what I believe that big difference is. The difference between object-oriented mathematics and expression-oriented mathematics. And then we're going to see that that's quite pertinent to this question of how exactly do we go about setting out what a curve is, what an algebraic curve is, and how we do calculus with such things. So I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Walberger. Thanks for listening.